And then when I was a senior, I came to Bob Jones and studied chemistry. I was really excited about having the opportunity to teach in a Christian school after that. Is that too concise? No, that's great. Okay. What makes what I'm doing different than what's going on in the public schools? What's Christian about Christian education? I looked at this earlier. I can't really think of specific um, actions, but I can definitely talk about um, ongoing struggle, and, and that is this. Um, you, you've worked so hard to bake. You're taking it to the farmer's market or delivering it to a customer uh, or a restaurant or whatever, and you're not thinking uh, or praying, Lord, give me an opportunity with this person. What I need to do is pray for them. Um, Lord, what opportunities uh, are you going to open up for me? Will I be listening and probing, or will I just be uh, taking their money? Sculptures. <laughs> you know, sometimes I talk to them and I, I try not to do that in public, but you have to get a sense for who they are and what they're doing and where they're looking and, you know, turn your head this way or turn your head that way. Ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> or... This is what artists do most. This is what we do. You don't always know who you're talking to. Aviation mechanics is what I've been interpreting the last two and a half years, and that's been very difficult. Because there, there are no signs for magneto and longeron and aileron and elevator and all these airplane signs. What is this device? Trevor and I would come up with signs that he could recognize the word, understand the part in the airplane, and then recognize the sign with it. You're communicating with your hands. You're talking with your hands. You're trying to express a thought. Art, I guess, is the same way. You're communicating with your hands and trying to give a thought of what this object is. So it evokes an emotion or it communicates something. And if my pieces don't communicate something, then I think I've lost. I get up early, real early, and turn on the coffee. We do a ciabatta a, and a basil cheese ciabatta. Country sourdough, rosemary olive oil sourdough, raisin pecan sourdough, six grain sourdough, red pepper parmesan sourdough. We'll do cinnamon swirl bread. We'll do cranberry walnut bread. A cobblestone cheddar loaf. Then we do 100% whole wheat. We do baguette. We also do croissants, chocolate croissants, cinnamon rolls. I usually stay away from the biological sciences. <laughs> but I've worked on, most recently, earth science, eighth grade, and physical science, ninth grade, chemistry, 11th grade, and physics, 12th grade. So algebra makes the fifth subject that I've worked on, which is a lot of different subjects for a part-time person to get involved in. <laughs> when you're creating a work of art, you don't know who's gonna be looking at it. It can be a child, and they'll look at it from a different perspective, obviously, but they'll look at it with a different frame of reference. Someone who knew Shulis Joe Jackson 
looks at him differently. They would know how he stood, how his foot was turned, how large his hands were. They would have a different relationship with him. And it also communicates differently depending on how the light and shadow hits it, um, how the mood of the person is at the time, if they're, if they're sad or quiet. Um, I remember someone told me that they were looking at the Gethsemane sculpture that I did. They were walking by and they saw a girl kneeling beside the Gethsemane sculpture just crying and praying. She was there at that prayer garden looking at it differently than some people who would just pass by. So I create the pieces not knowing really the full extent of what's going to happen with them, but every one of them is different. The great thing about it is food touches everybody. It doesn't matter your station. Even this past Saturday, I had a lady, I asked her how she was doing and she said, hey, um, would you pray for me? And she shared some things that are going on in her life you're really able to build bridges with people, especially if you can make the thing they love and the thing they remember from their childhood or their cultural background, and they'll just share anything with you. Usually when I start a sculpture, I do a small scale model, a maquette, so that um, the client knows what it's going to look like. Um, I could do sketches and drawings, but I like working in 3D because I can solve a lot of problems and work out details and kind of get the idea for myself. And then I can present it to the client and they can turn it around and get a good grasp of what it's supposed to look like. After I get a sculpture finished, the clay's all done, I call the foundry and say, all right, it's time. It's usually cut in pieces uh, like the head is cut off and the arms are cut off, and then the, uh, after the head is cut off, it's divided into two parts. They'll make a mold, and once that mold has been made, uh, wax will be brushed inside the mold until it's about three quarters of an inch thick. That mold is popped out so you have an exact replica. Complete with fingerprints and everything else of the original clay. That wax then is dipped in about 12 layers of porcelain slurry and then it's fired and the wax on the inside melts out and the bronze is poured in. Uh, and then the porcelain is beat off and then you weld all the pieces back together again. It takes about six months to do a life-size sculpture um, and a whole team of people at the foundry. I do a lot of my baking through the night before the work day. We'll come out and we'll just mix. At some point, I will start the fire. The dough's bulk ferment. Then we cut, shape. The fire is cleaned out completely. Based on um, the temperature required for the breads, that's the order we want the breads to be ready in. So like the baguette, the ciabatta, which are leaner doughs, they would get fired first. The ciabatta would be 550, then the baguette would be around 475, then the sourdoughs after that, and then we would go down the line. And then it's gotta be cooled, sliced and packaged. My wife takes care of delivering. What's different is Fridays because we are baking anywhere from 150 to 200 loaves just for the farmer's market, and we're talking about 15 to 20 varieties. This I'm a secondary science author. He's trying to get it done before that really gets going. Where is he doing that? I work with a team of writers. There's three main authors. And with our textbooks, we also have a committee of teachers who we consult as we're writing as well. So it's really a team effort. So I wanted to let you know that about the data. I think the question... And we also have a Bible integration coordinator that we send all of our writing through. I write for the student, I work on the teacher, and I write tests, and I develop online content as well. And I also speak to visiting principals and administrators and teachers. They come to get some philosophy and they come to see the books and so I speak to them about secondary science as well. I was actually raised in southern Illinois. I lived on a small hill and as far as you could see there was nothing but 
flat fields. So I was saved and brought up really with a, a heart to serve the Lord. But um, realizing, especially in my teen years, uh, that a lot of my Christianity was, uh, I guess, behavior based. Um, I knew what I was like on the inside and I knew the struggles and uh, I knew how to perform on the outside. It wasn't until maybe college and um, after that, and even now, that God is still uh, working in my life and cleansing me and uh, helping me to understand how sinful I am and how much I need Him every day. I grew up in Connorsville, Indiana, which is a little factory town right in the middle of Indiana, halfway between Indianapolis and Cincinnati. Small place. My dad was a factory worker. My mom was a housewife. Uh, there were four of us kids who grew up at the public school there. I took some art classes, and that's where my art interest was peaked. I got saved when I was 10 years old. There was a, a little church. My little church actually started in my parents' uh, garage uh, on our property in a little town. I came to Bob Jones because my dad said, you can go anywhere you want as long as it's Bob Jones. And they had a good art program, so I said, okay, that's, that's good for me. Are you kidding me? I was scared to death. I hadn't even gone away to camp before. I was a little tiny skinny freshman. Bob Jones University is almost larger than my hometown. So it was, it was overwhelming to me. I didn't know anybody. Uh, my sister was there a year ahead of me, and that was it. We didn't have cell phones back then to communicate all the time and, and uh, email and all that. It was a letter once a week at best, and I was not good at returning letters. As a freshman, I was very, uh, okay, truth be told, I almost ran away from school. Okay, you can edit this if you want to. <laughs> I was working in the dining common my freshman year, you know, it wasn't an easy job. I was garbage detail, you know, scraping all the trays and banging things and the big barrels of chicken debris and bones and all that had to be tossed. And one Thanksgiving, I was so homesick and I just thought, I'm out of here. And I looked at the road going out, you know, 291. I thought, I wonder, I wonder if I could just find a way home. <laughs> I've just had it. I also remember when I was at Bob Jones, you know, I didn't pass my sophomore art check. I don't know if you know that, but um, I was asked to change majors. And uh, some people say, that's terrible. How could they have asked you to do that? And I struggled with that a long time. I, uh, I wasn't ready to be an art major. I wasn't ready to make it on my own. And uh, now I realize that God has brought this back. I was like I said, I, I didn't do any art for, I don't know, seven or 10 years. But God used that to send me to Faith Christian School in Ramsar and to be a youth pastor and to grow up and to learn some things. I was youth pastor, music director, janitor, bus driver, whatever, you know. And I taught art and I taught music and I taught science. We had all kinds of kids in our class, you know, chicken farmer kids and tobacco farmer kids and just all kinds. You're teaching kids and you never know what they're going to be when they grow up. We had one who graduated and became a lawyer. We had one who graduated and became Dean of Women. We had one who became the Dean of the School of Fine Arts at Bob Jones University. Then there was a continuing education class in uh, North Carolina and Asheboro, and there was a sculptor there who taught art classes. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I took some sculpting classes and uh, just really enjoyed it. And then I didn't do anything from that until I came here to Greenville 10 years later. While I was there, there was a workshop on sign language. So I took some workshops and met some deaf people and ended up interpreting at the wilds for two summers. But God has a way of just, you know, letting things grow and letting things mellow and letting us learn. I also directed the Handbell Choir at Faith. And uh, we came back one year. Um, a friend of mine was working at Bob Jones University Press. He gave me a tour and he said that they were looking for somebody to head up the advertising and marketing department. Well, I just laughed because I hadn't passed my art check and it was still kind of tender in my mind. So 
I thought about it, we prayed about it, and we came here. My wife worked customer services. I started the advertising marketing for the press. We did all the catalogs, advertising pieces, sound forth, show forth, all the covers and CD covers and all that. So I was there for 10 years or 12 years. And then after that, they wanted to do the web technology. Uh, I have a separate division for that. So I moved over there and we did the internet and intranet sites. And both departments grew and um, I grew, learned a lot. After that, they closed that department down. So I had a decision to make, you know, look for another job on campus or try making it as a sculptor. I really didn't know much about baking at all growing up. Um, when I was in high school, I guess uh, that's when I first, my first contact with a bakery, I started delivering donuts for a local donut shop. Then I came on to Bob Jones and worked three and a half years in the Dining Common Bakery. And that was sort of the beginning. I worked with a gentleman who had owned his own bakery in Columbus, Ohio. He sort of started the passion in me for this business because even though I didn't know much and my exposure to the industry wasn't much, um, I just, I loved it. Especially as I began to realize um, I could actually do something specialized that God put into me. It's kind of cliche, but you know, the movie Chariots of Fire where Eric Little says, God made me, he made me fast and it brings him pleasure when I run and that's how I feel about um, baking. God put that in me, and I feel his pleasure when I'm doing it. But I also begin to realize um, the power of food. So I graduated from school and uh, went on to work for the wilds. And then after that, in retail bakeries, wholesale bakeries, uh, a couple of restaurants, and um, that was how I got into the industry. I'm the oldest of five kids. Both of my parents are first-generation Christians from the New Jersey, New York area. In fact, my aunt is a nun, so my parents took our family in an entirely different direction. They were growing as Christians even before we were born. I got saved when I was five years old. I remember hearing the gospel. I remember learning hymns. I remember I was by myself actually at home. I was helping my mom clean the house. And one of those songs that I had learned in church was running through my mind about the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I remember the Holy Spirit just really hitting me that I had never been saved before, that Jesus' blood had never covered my sins before. And I just knew I had to get saved. And I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart and save me. And I remember running and telling my mom, I just got saved, I just got saved. My parents really had a vision for Christian education and they really wanted to get us involved. That's one of the reasons why we moved here to South Carolina. In third grade, I went to a small Christian school out in Spartanburg. When I was in seventh grade, they really needed a math teacher. And my mom studied science and math in college. So they said, well, could you please teach? So I had my mom for math when I was in seventh grade. My mom was really excited about integrating the Bible into her, her lessons. Of course, integrating the Bible into math is a really hard thing to do. I really felt like there was even more that could be done than what she was doing but I didn't know what it was. I remember when I was a junior and I toured the university with a group from my school and the tour guide asked, does anybody know where they wanna to go to school and what they wanna study? And so I said, yeah, I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna study chemistry and I'm gonna go teach in a Christian school. That was exactly what I did. During my senior year of college, I was really seeking the Lord's will. Over the course of my senior year, I heard from about 150 Christian schools. Eventually, I narrowed it down to two schools. I visited a school in Michigan, and then at the end of the week, I visited Trinity in Vermont. And when I flew in, there was a snow that was just starting to lightly fall, and I said, oh boy, this is really nice. I really felt like the Lord wanted me to go. I had had 
very little teaching experience. I dove right into it and preparing my lessons and I set up my classroom, I plastered it with posters and really started getting to know the students and getting a handle on classroom management and all of that and just really starting to learn how to teach. When I began my third year of teaching, I took kind of a step back and said, what am I really doing? What makes what I'm doing different than what's going on in the public schools? What's Christian about Christian education? What's Christian about teaching science in a Christian school? I really thought the Lord was leading me to become a sculptor and to see what was out there. I had already done the Shoeless Joe Jackson statue at that point. I was uh, traveling with Facklemen's Chorus when I was at Bob Jones. I think we were traveling in Texas, but Gene Fisher was part of the group, and uh, as we were traveling on the big bus, we were making conversation, and he asked me what I like to do, and I said, well, I like sculpting. He said, can you sculpt this? And there was a picture of Shoeless Joe Jackson in the newspaper, and I said, sure. So uh, when we got back, I just thought, I'm, I'm gonna do a sculpture of that. So I did a small sculpture of Shoeless Joe Jackson and showed it to him, and he got all excited, and. Uh, we had a small bronze made. Then Dr. Bob III found out about it, and he said, I didn't know you did sculpture. And so he called me up to his office and had me bring it up there and uh, show it to him. And he called the mayor while I was standing there. And it's like, what's going on here? And the mayor was out of town, but he made me promise to get in touch with Knox White when uh, the mayor got back in town. Well, I really felt awkward about that. I mean, it's like, hello, Mayor, you don't know me, and I don't know you, but Dr. Bob said, call, and I've got this statue here, and that's what I did. <laughs> they had been wanting a life-size statue of Shoeless Joe Jackson for two years, and they asked me, would I be willing to do it? And before I knew it, I had said, sure. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. I have never done a life-size sculpture before. Now, I have done full figures, and I have done life-size busts, but I have never done a full life-size figure. So I called the foundry and said, you know, can I do this? And I called my former art teacher in North Carolina. Oh, you can do this, he said. You got this, you can do this. So with their help and their, their suggestions, I was able to get the whole thing basically done, the, the good majority of the clay put on, and um, I really didn't have a place to finish it. It was trying to do it in my garage. It just wasn't working very well. The mayor's assistant said, well, you can build it in the lobby of City Hall. And I thought, what? <laughs> you know, I was hoping for a bigger garage. So they gave me a key to City Hall. So people walking by day and night could watch me working on the statues. And I'd give everybody a piece of clay and they could knead the clay and rub it in. And then I'd just blend it into the statue. Years later, I took my dad to see the statue. While we were there, there was little kids there, and one of them came running up to me and said, do you remember me? And he said, I helped make that statue. And I thought, well, good for you. You know, that, that was really a good thing. But that's, that's how Shoeless Joe Jackson got started. And uh, that's sort of how my whole art thing got started and how it kept going. When I was in my third year of teaching, really contemplating what in the world am I doing, I went to a conference in Massachusetts, and the keynote speaker spoke on a Christian worldview, how your perspective in which you interpret all of life, how the assumptions that you, that you take when you view the world and how those assumptions color the way you see everything. And when I heard that, I said, that, that is it. That is the core of the idea. I still have no idea how to integrate the Bible into my classroom teaching, but I really feel like this worldview idea is really at the, at the core, at the foundation of, all, of the answer to that question. I remember that I was in advanced math class and I was teaching my students about matrices. And I remember a student raising his hand in class and saying, Ms. Quatt, when am I ever going to use this in my life? Why in the world am I doing this? And I said, because I told you to, now be quiet and do your work. <laughs> but I was really unhappy with that answer. Now, if he had asked me that question, I would say something like, well, you never know how the Lord can use your experiences. The Lord doesn't waste experiences. And matrices and math in general 
gives us a really great tool to model God's world, to understand God's world, so that we can exercise better dominion over it and so that we can help our neighbor. That experience really made me want to be able to answer that question. And at that point, I wasn't doing very much Bible integration in my instruction. The most I tried to do was do a devotional at the beginning. And that's like, that's zero integration. <laughs> One of the ideas that I encountered when I was teaching was the idea of the two-story view. And this idea goes way back to the early church. The idea that the spiritual was righteous and sacred and that material things were evil. The bottom story is your house where you have your trash that needs to be taken out and your kitchen that needs to be cleaned. and. Those are all the normal day-to-day -day stuff that you do. And the upper story, the second story, is your church. That's where your worship happens. That's where you give. That's where you serve. And so what the Christian does at church is really important. What they do at home is not quite as important. The two-story view would say what pastors do is really important. But what doctors and lawyers and plumbers do isn't quite as important as what they do. And that's really depressing because the large percentage of your day is spent mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, and cleaning up your kitchen. And if you have a, a job where you're, you know, working on computers or, you know, whatever, that would be stuff that the two-story view would say is not really significant spiritually. That's something that left me with this sinking feeling that this can't be right. There's got to be a way for us to unify, to pull that wall down and to unify the whole Christian life. Why did God create Adam? He created him for his own glory and he created him for fellowship. He created Adam bearing his image. Most of the things that I spend time on can't count for eternity. But when I break down that two-story thinking in my own mind and realize that all of the Christian life can be done for one unified purpose, and that is to bring glory to God, that makes me really excited about everything that I do. So whether I'm at work writing a chapter opener or writing test questions or whether I'm presenting to educators, that can be done for God's glory. Or whether I'm at home taking care of my family, cleaning my house, weeding my garden, that can be done for God's glory too. Again, Dr. Bob was talking to the president of North Greenville. The president there was saying how he wanted to have another statue. Uh, and uh, so Dr. Bob said, well, why don't, why don't you get Doug Young? I went out there and met Dr. Epting and talked to him. And he said he wanted a praying hands Jesus. I really struggled with what to do with that piece. I wanted that moment in the garden where he's saying, not my will, but thine be done. I had done three or four uh, mock-ups before, not really come up with anything I liked. And I was reading in the English version for the deaf, how it says he fell down in an agony. That's what I want. I want his hand on the rock and I want him looking up in agony. I did a small scale model and took it to the president of North Greenville University. He was having a board meeting there and I didn't realize that. I thought it was just going to be taking it to him. He had everybody kind of gather around the table and I walked in and I had it covered up and uh, he said, I've asked Doug to do a praying hands to Jesus. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> this is not maybe what he wanted. But they all gathered around real close and, and I uncovered it. And one of the older gentlemen kind of gasps and uh, steps back a little bit and starts getting tears in his eyes. And he said, I can feel the agony in this. And I thought, that's what I want. You know, that's, that's exactly what I want to communicate that um, he took on this for us. I want you and my students, my children, to be able to see the world through biblical glasses. So when you look at something in the world, whether it's the Grand Canyon or whether it's the problem of disease or poverty in the world and to be able to look at it from a biblical perspective, to be able to tell 
when someone else is interpreting it from a secular perspective so that you can have an answer to give to them, so that you can show them that a Christian worldview makes sense. You know, the Lord's done this. It's not like I looked for these opportunities. Sometimes we can get too calculating and thinking, okay, what's God's will for my life? And really struggling with that. And take into account that the things that you love to do, God's put into your heart and life. And then think, okay, this is what I really love to do. Now, how can I use it for the kingdom? Because that's, that's what we're here for. The biggest reward for an artist is to know that it's really communicating what you've poured yourself into. None of us are perfect. You know, I think, I think what we've done before is we have had a tendency to put other spiritual leaders up on pedestals. We raise and lower people according to what we think they do. But God doesn't judge us on what we do, but on who we are and how we're related to Christ. behind the metal pieces of metal the paintings the drawings whatever all that's going to be burned up that's not important um, what I leave behind is people and what I can take with me to heaven is people Thank you for paying attention to the end. <laughs>